in most uh, countries on the continent, there were princes. They were absolute regimes. The degree of absolutism was relative to the particular setting. But if you take France as the most important, central, most populous country, uh, you had uh, a very elaborate system of censorship. But in addition to that, you had a monopoly of production in the Booksellers Guild in Paris. It had police powers. And then the police itself had specialized inspectors of the book trade. So you put all of that together, and uh, the state was very powerful in its attempt to control the printed word. By the time you get to the age of the Enlightenment, there's a highly organized administration of the book trade. So in principle, anything that appears in print has to pass the censorship and be registered to go through an elaborate process. Uh, and of course, this uh, didn't work. Uh, the directions set, the, the organization uh, set up by the state was so elaborate, so baroque in its bureaucracy, that in a sense it was counterproductive. Uh, censorship, you know, <laughs> varies from regime to regime. We think we know what censorship is, but I would argue that it, it's a different thing under different systems. So the basic idea of censorship in 18th century France is the concept of privilege or private law. A publisher gets the right to publish a particular text that is denied to others. So he has that privilege. That's different from censorship under Stalin, say, or Hitler. Um, there is a monopoly of the, what's called the Communauté des Libraires et des Imprimeurs de Paris, uh, the Booksellers Guild of Paris. It has police power. Uh, its syndics uh, and adjoints, they're called, uh, are obliged to inspect all of the printing houses in Paris. Uh, the, print, the printers are officially limited to 36 printing shops. And so the guild is supposed to go around from shop to shop, find out what they're printing, uh, make sure there are no illegal books being printed, printed no books that um, contravene privileges, the equivalent of copyright in a sense, etc. So yes, they have powers and they also inspect every single book that is shipped into Paris. The books are stopped at the wall which surrounds Paris um, and any shipment uh, marked uh, Libri books uh, is sent to a special uh, large hall where the Booksellers Guild and an inspector of the police will inspect it. So essentially what you have is a centralized administration for controlling the book trade using censorship and also using the monopoly of the established publishers. Against that you've got publishing houses, printing presses that surround France in what I call a fertile crescent. Uh, dozens and dozens of them producing books which are smuggled across the French borders, distributed everywhere in the kingdom by an underground system. Uh, so in effect you've got two systems at war with one another and it's the system of production outside France that is crucial for the Enlightenment. Virtually all of the works that we associate with the French Enlightenment are published in Amsterdam, in The Hague, in Brussels, in Geneva, in Neuchâtel, Basel. Uh, these are the places where Rousseau, Voltaire and company get themselves printed. But these printers also produce other things because they're in it not simply uh, to spread enlightenment. Many of them are sympathetic to the enlightenment. They're in it to make money. Uh, so they will satisfy demand whatever the demand might be. So the pirates had agents in Paris and everywhere else who were sending them sheets of new books which they think will sell well. The pirates are systematically doing, I use the word, it's an anachronism, market research. Uh, they uh, do it, I, I've seen it in, in hundreds and literally thousands of letters. They are sounding the market. They want to know what demand is. And so the reaction on the part of the publishers at the center is of course extremely hostile and uh, I've read a lot of their letters. They're full of expressions like buccaneer and private and uh, you know people without shame or morality etc. In actual fact many of these pirates were good bourgeois in Lausanne or Geneva or Amsterdam and they thought that they were just doing business after all. 
there was no international copyright law, and they were satisfying demand. If the demand happened to be in France, well, that's, that's a problem for the French, but not for the Dutch or the Swiss. I, I must admit, I always hesitate to pronounce on world historical trends, but I've spent a lot of time in the archives, and you can at least glimpse something that might look world historical from time to time as you go through various bits of old paper. Uh, what is clear is that during the 18th century, the printed word as a force is just expanding everywhere. And we can go into lots of detailed studies to find out why and how this happens. The population is increasing. The educational institutions are spreading. Literacy is going up. And there is this new thing we call public opinion. The phrase itself is first used in the middle of the 18th century. I think the phenomenon existed earlier, but for the last half of the 18th century, there is a public that is fascinated with public affairs. Now, the mechanism for controlling the media, if you want to use that expression, notably the print media, is simply not adequate to controlling this demand. So everywhere around France, even within France, there are entrepreneurs who take it upon themselves to satisfy this demand. And this can be in the form of clandestine manuscript newsletters. It can be in the form of fully printed books. And there are many other forms. The one that I find most interesting is songs. Uh, it turns out that uh, everyone in the 18th century, if you take Paris, had a repertory of tunes in his or her head, as we do today. Most of my tunes come from commercials, actually. Uh, people would improvise new words to old tunes every day. Uh, and these would be sung in the streets of Paris, sometimes by professionals who had hurdy-gurdies and would uh, simply belt out the last verse uh, to a tune that everyone knew. Uh, and it could be about the king's mistress. It could be about a minister who's abusing power. Uh, it could be uh, on a whole variety of quite political subjects. This new verse is then picked up because it's a great mnemonic device. And the song is being sung throughout the streets of Paris. I mean, I imagine the streets of Paris is just echoing everywhere with songs. So that's a good example of how in the absence of news media, uh, of proper newspapers, as we would call it, a new kind of uh, medium develops that actually does the job of newspapers. I mean, I would, I've, I've studied hundreds of these songs, and I would say they were sung newspapers. So there's no way that a, an absolutist political system can totally suppress the spread of information. New media uh, adapt themselves to these circumstances, and often they be, can become even more effective because of the repression. It's a fascinating process, and I think it culminates, frankly, right on the eve of the French Revolution, so that I would argue not only did this new media system spread the Enlightenment, but... I won't use the word prepared the way for the revolution. It so um, indicted the old regime that this, this power, public opinion, became crucial in the collapse of the government in 1787-1788.